So hello, good evening and welcome to this conference, The Colors of Existence, Discovering the Fascinating World of Egon Schiele. My name is Rick Serrano and I am here with the International Kunstverein Luxembourg. We are very pleased to be here. Let me start by thanking Her Excellency Madame Melita Schubert for having us here tonight. For the second time that she receives us here at the residence, it's an honor for us to be here. And let me also thank her team, especially Claudia, who has been very, very helpful throughout the process of uh, organization of this conference. We are really very honored to be here. So just to situate ourselves, let me remind you of the conferences that we held last year or actually last academic year. We had conference on René Descartes, on the Greeks. Uh, we had, of course, the Ludwig Wittgenstein conference here in November, and then we had Heidegger, the mystics, Taoism, and many other things. We also held last year a couple of painting exhibitions and a couple of events on Dante Alighieri, where we were celebrating the 700 years of the dead. And tonight we are here to talk about Egon Schiele. Uh, let me make the classical um, disclaimer and the uh, let me state the objectives of our presentations at the International Kunstverein Luxembourg. Let me remind you that um, we organize these talks rather to bring you closer to philosophy and to art and sh to show you how this is important and relevant in your life. But let me remind you that this is not an academic presentation. So this does not have, of course, the uh, academic rigor of a university lecture or anything like that. What we want to do here is we want to transmit you our passion for philosophy and for the arts in general. In this case, is more for painting. And that is why we are here tonight to talk about Egon Schiele. Now, let me tell you that I feel very honored to have all this crowd here. It's amazing uh, how many people have shown interest. Let me tell you that uh, on top of all of you, as you can see, we cannot fit in more people here. We had something like 20, 25 people who wanted to come and could not, uh, we, we just could not accommodate them. But uh, thank you very much for your interest. I have to say that I feel honored and at the same time a little bit overwhelmed because, of course, uh, <laughs> maybe your expectations are very high and uh, I am definitely not an expert in Egon Schiele. I ju I'm just somebody who enjoys uh, Egon Schiele a lot and who enjoys his painting and who amuses himself um, creating reproductions of Egon Schiele and other things and uh, of somebody who likes to uh, study the different painters and philosophers. And I think Egon Schiele presents uh, to us a unique opportunity. So this is more than a, an academic uh, conference, it's rather a talk among friends. And uh, as always, we will make it like an interactive conversation. So please, I tend to speak very fast because I have a lot of material to show to you, but do not hesitate to stop me at any point. If you have questions, if you have comments, just raise your hand. And uh, we will, of course, uh, handle any comment or questions. We will also have a dedicated uh, such, uh, time at the end of the presentation for Q&A. And, &A. and um, I will be making you, I will be asking you questions as we go through, because again, we want to make this interactive. Let me remind you, we do have some prizes, like always, for those of you who dare to <laughs> try to give an answer to the questions that we will be presenting to you. Of course, there are no right or wrong answers. This is art. So this is about enjoying it. So do not hesitate, jump in to try to answer the questions. There is very interesting four prizes to win tonight. So let's get started. We will be talking about Egon Chile. Egon Chile had a very polemic, very radical, very extreme life. As you know, uh, he has been very controversial, very, uh, well, yeah, radical. And he only lived 28 years, as you know, most, most of you might know the biographical data. And uh, I, I thought that for this presentation, um, we will be uh, making a different order in the presentation. So normally what we do is we give you some biographical information about the, the painter or the philosopher, then we move to explain their works. And then finally, we conclude with the legacy and so forth. Uh, of course, you know very well that Egon Schiele is worldwide famous for his colors, for his lines, for his drawings, for his erotism, 
for all those uh, things. But uh, I, I thought that tonight maybe we start the presentation in a different order. So if you allow me, I'm going to start the presentation upside down. So I'm going to start by the end. And I'm going to uh, talk to you, first of all, about his legacy and a little bit of his influence, because I think that will give you may maybe, maybe information that you might not know. Uh, so you probably know all the biographical data. So let me just uh, give you uh, some really like um, some strokes about uh, information on his legacy. First, let me talk about uh, legacy on movies. So there's a couple of um, movies that have been created. Some of them are very, very interesting. I recommend them. So the first one is Excess and Pursuit um, with uh, Mathieu Carrière. This is a movie from 1980. Uh, in German, it's called Only Excess. And as you can see, let me call your attention to the subtitle of the, of the movie. The subtitle is Kunst oder Pornographie. As you know, it has always been debated, you know, whether this is uh, art or pornography. Of course, I believe it is art, plant, totally. But uh, many people have, 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 of course, questioned that. And that is why he was uh, so, so much criticized at several points in his life. So that's one movie that I recommend you, Excess and Pursuit. Another one that I uh, can bring to you is uh, Chile in Prison, which is more like a doc documentary by Alessandra Comini. And another one that I like a lot is Dead and the Maiden, uh, Todd und Mädchen by Dieter Berner, which is, by the way, an Austrian Luxembourgish production. I think uh, uh, this, this is a very good one. I really like it, or at least I like it. Um, uh, you might find some accuracy details. Yes, I agree. But um, in general terms, I think it's a, it's a very interesting movie also uh, and shows you many of the things that we will be talking about here tonight. So that's in terms of the movies. In terms of the literature, let me tell you, um, probably the most important influence is on Mario Vargas Llosa's Los Cuadernos de Don Rigoberto, the notebooks of Don Rigoberto from 1997, where um, a, a man uh, spends a lot of time fantasizing, having erotic fantasies uh, that um, take him a little bit away of his uh, ordinary boring life. So I also invite you to uh, check that book. And uh, there's another book that, uh, to be honest, I have not read, but I have heard very positive things. It's called Arrogance by Joanna Scott from 1990. Uh, they tell me is a very good book, which I don't know, but I just bring it to you in case you could be interested. Now, um, this is <coughs> just to tell you a little bit about the legacy. Now, let me tell you, let me start by launching you the first question about the influence that Egon Schiele has had. Let me tell you, does anybody know who was uh, his number one fan? You know, there's somebody from uh, who was very famous in the 70s who was his number one fan. So if anybody knows, uh, this is the time to win a, a, a beautiful book, um, um, Egon Schiele. Well, the answer is David Bowie. David Bowie he has been uh, very influenced. He declared that he, his music has been very influenced by the paintings and the drawings of Egon Schiele. He is, by the way, fascinated by the poses, by the positions that Egon Schiele uh, paints always uh, and draws always. And he constantly was imitating Egon Schiele's positions. And there's many, uh, many, di many uh, discs, so many LPs, this is of course the 70s, that, um, that uh, reproduce David Bowie imitating Egon Schiele. Uh, look at this, he, he really enjoyed it. You, you can tell when you start studying this. I, I didn't know this before preparing this talk, but. Uh, uh, when you go into the detail of David Bowie's admiration for Schiele, you will see that he was really fascinated. There are many, many uh, discs created uh, with covers similar to Egon Schiele's uh, works. So the, he was his number one fan, I tend to say. Very uh, polemic, the cover of the LP Lodger uh, from 1979, where his position, of course, reminds us of of some of the paintings by um, Egon Schiele. Now, uh, in terms of sales of Egon Schiele, maybe you have different information. The information that I have is that his most expensive painting has been sold for $40 million. 
um, auction by Sotheby's. Um, a painting from 1914 called Houses with Colorful Laundry or simply Houses with Laundry, which is a little bit curious because you normally know uh, Chile for his nudes or for his uh, portraits. And, uh, you know, it happens that uh, apparently, apparently, maybe you know better, but apparently the most expensive one so far has been this one, uh, Houses with Colorful Laundry. In any case, as you probably know, uh, architects adore uh, Egon Schiele. Architects tend to love Egon Schiele. So I don't know if there's any uh, architect tonight with us here at the house, but you can probably confirm this. Now, let me also tell you something uh, about his signature. I, I, th this is a very personal, uh, let me say, theory or idea about his signature. Egon Schiele always um, uh, created his signature so, sort of like an ex libris, sort of like a, writing his name, Egon Chile, and then put it like in a box. And I have the theory, of course, this is just my idea, uh, not, not uh, solid foundations for this, but I want to share it with you, that um, Egon Chile, when he signs his drawings and his paintings this way, with this, uh, with this sort of ex libris, he is reflecting a lot of his personality. So he is showing us that the uh, words Egon Chile are moving. As you see, they are like uh, with, with, uh, they are dynamic. They have like a, like a movement. Take a look at the S, take a look at the E. And they also remind us of the positions of their bodies, you know, all, all the hands, the twisted hands, the twisted uh, chests and, and the um, impossible legs. And so, it reminds us of this Egon Chile who, who is moving, right? But at the same time, it has the box that is like limiting it. Like it's like um, putting him like a little bit in a prison, like putting some some constraints. Huh? As we will see, Egon Chile will feel many times criticized um, by, uh, especially on, uh, with regards to his um, his nudity paintings and drawings. He would be very criticized. Uh, for moral reasons, and he was very upset about that. Every time somebody would criticize uh, some of his works, he would say, this is old-fashioned, you, your thinking is old-fashioned, and, and this is, has nothing to do with morality, and he would always not, not so much discuss about the painting or the drawing itself and try to argue back about the morality or not morality of the painting. No, he would go and talk about his status. So he would say very distinctly, he would clearly say, Ich bin ein Kunstmaler. I am a painter artist. That means I am above your stupidity. I am above your rules of morality. I am above your narrow-minded thinking because art is, be is beyond that. Art is above that. And he will repeat that um, constantly if you watch the movies, you will uh, notice it as well. So, of course, uh, we will be talking about his painting, his drawing. Characteristic are the colors, and that's why I call the talk the colors of existence, because I think, well, of course, he is sort of like existentialism and, um, and, and also expressionism, like showing all the strength. But I think the colors tell us a lot about the existence of the human being. T they tell us a lot about the uh, the crude reality of human life their eye uh, his eyes his his uh, positions his bodies they all constantly are reminding us of the fragility of, of the vulnerability of the human being take a look at this one here for example several characters on one painting and they are looking at, uh, in in different directions like like questioning themselves take a look at the woman on the top like really it's like she's questioning herself she's like questioning her existence and the other two are like passive like you know they accommodate to the situation but i i think there is this drama always around the the characters of um of uh, egon chile of course you need to remember he grew up in the vienna of the uh, secession so uh, remember this movement that uh, was created uh, among others by gustav klimt um, uh, the, the, the very famous lemma, the very famous motto they had, Der Zeit ihre Kunst, der Kunst ihre Freiheit. So every time it's art, to every art it's freedom. So freedom is very important here. Freedom is going to be one of the key factors here. Now this is a photograph of the secession. 
you can see there Gustav Klimt sitting like I, I always think of him like sitting like a like a Roman emperor or so, you know, like a, um, one of these Roman emperors with uh, with that uh, robe and and you know really they were of course as you know you, you know about the secession they wanted to change the flow of art they wanted to move from the traditional they wanted to be aggressive and creative and innovative and that's what they were doing so uh, a couple of uh, biographical data about Egon Schiele. He was born 12th of June 1980 in Tulln and der Donau. Uh, he had uh, three sisters, Elvira, Melanie and Gertrude. Here is he with uh, two of them. Uh, Gertrude is not there. Gertrude is the youngest one and the one with him. He had a very, very close relationship. Uh, um, and um, this is a, another photograph of uh, Chile as a boy. And you can tell his expression is telling you already a lot like like I don't fit here like I yeah I'm here but you know I don't necessarily fit it his father Adolf was a, a train station master and Sheila was fascinated with trains but what he wanted to do was paint and draw the trains and his father would be very angry about that and his father would destroy his sketchbook so you know always there is like this sense of somebody else is condemning my art. So I come up with drawings, I come up with paintings, and there's somebody else who comes and destroys my art. This is so disturbing for him. The father will die of syphilis, and then he will pass to the protection of his uh, uncle, who would be a little bit more tolerant, but not that much, a little bit more, more tolerant, but he will, um, this is again the family, uh, with the kids, uh, Melanie and Elvira, and this uh, then the, the uncle finally lets him go to the academy because he gets accepted into the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna. Uh, you can imagine what this uh, meant. Uh, this is a super huge accomplishment, especially at his age. He was 16 and he was the youngest ever accepted at the academy. So this uh, tells you already about the talent and this tells you already that the painters and the artists in the Vienna of the beginning of last century, they were conscious, they were acknowledging already his quality and his potential. And this photograph I like a lot is uh, around the age of 16. Once again, take a look at the way he stares at us. So his presence, you know, is there, he's staring at you. And then with this hair, always very massive hair, very representative of him, like a, like a big um, sort of bonnet. And um, he is already showing us that there is like fire inside of him, that there is like a lot of energy that wants to come out and that wants to get splashed with the color and with the lines. 1907, Schiele meets Klimt. And you all know, of course, Klimt. You, Klimt is everywhere, of course. It's ubiquitous. You have it on uh, coffee mugs, uh, keychains, T-shirts, posters, um, swatch watches, whatever, right? And, but this is, he became, he became his sort of a, a pro protector and his uh, teacher and he, he, they immediately um, sort of uh, established like a clique and they liked each other a lot. Uh, although they have, of course, their differences, but Klim would take him sort of like as a protege and will uh, show him many things of the art and will introduce him to many movements. Now, it's important to notice that there are strong, strong differences between the, the uh, let's say, the master and the pupil, although there was not such a relationship. But uh, uh, if you think of the women painted by Klimt, who, who, who you, which you know very well, and if you think of the women painted by Schiele, there are important differences, important differences. So let me ask you if anybody wants to share with us, what are the differences that, you, that stroke you? What are the differences that come most evidently here? Well, the difference that comes most evident to me are the women painted by Klimt are more like perfect women, like ideal, ideal, idealistic sort of models, even from the old times, like Greco-Roman times, very perfect with jewels, with all this gold and all these mosaic-like backgrounds and very aristocratic people, even the Wittgenstein and so forth. So they, they show you the power uh, of the of the women uh, of the um, aristocracy of the Vienna of the beginning of the last century, 
And this is going to be brutally, radically different than Egon Schiele. Egon Schiele is going to show us women as they are, as his system, as they are brutally nude in the reality with their def defects, with their, with their things, and not in an ideal. So it's a drastic difference. I think it's important to mention it. Now, uh, again, he was um, participating at the uh, succession. He was very active uh, at the succession. Klimt, of course, was always there. They have this uh, motto that we already mentioned, to every age it's art, to art it's freedom. And they had a publication called Ver Sacrum uh, that uh, was uh, very important at the time. Um, uh, Klim was showing him, was showing uh, Egon Schiele different tendencies, different trends of art, like Art Nouveau, Art Deco, the Jugendstil, uh, different uh, art tendencies that there were present in Vienna of the last century. Through him, he got to know uh, painters like Edvard Munch and like um, like Vincent van Gogh. But he was always like, uh, Egon was always like going away of the traditional. He was always, yes, okay, I am now at the academy, but at some point, you know, even the academy is not enough for me. So he at some point leaves and goes and creates with other artists, the Neukunstgruppe in 1909. And he's gonna start there with his real style. He's gonna move into the more aggressive, more radical, more violent uh, paintings and drawings, more, let's say, more grotesque. Uh, he will create this and then there is at the Neukunstgruppe is where he's gonna see, we're gonna see all the power of his uh, drawing, all the power of his painting, all the strength, um, and he will be departing from the classical art schools. Now, uh, he created the group together with other very important artists like Oskar Kokoschka or Max Oppenheimer. And then at some point he had his first uh, solo show. Uh, this painting, by the way, is the painting that was selected by the Fondation Louis Vuitton to make a recent uh, exhibition in Paris very famous uh, exhibition in Paris. And of course they wanted to use this one because it's so classy, right? Uh, whereas most of the paintings by uh, Egon Schiele, as I was saying before, are rude, are like rough and are like aggressive and, and, and even with pain. This one is elegant. This one is distinguished, of course. And that is why I think it was selected by the Louis Vuitton Foundation. Now, around 1910, give or take 1910, he starts painting and drawing nudity very strongly. And this is, uh, once again, a photograph of the um, Louis Vuitton Foundation. I think it's important to mention that the nudity uh, after Egon Schiele, for me, is a, it creates a different kind of nudity than the art, than what we find in art before Schiele. After Schiele, it's like we look at nudity in a different way because it's, it's not the sensuality of other ages, it's not the, the romanticism of other ages, it's the crude reality and it's the strong um, elements and, and the, the rough images that, that strike us. So that's what I brought you this photograph of a woman, especially a woman, uh, looking at a painting a nudity painting by Schiele. So anyway, he starts with this kind of nudity and he, th this is where he, really his genius comes and explodes, right? Because you see the lines and you see the spaces and the volumes created and you see the use of color. We're going to be talking a lot about color and lines because color and lines are the elements that really show you all the existence and all the drama uh, hidden in uh, the, 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 the figures that he uses, or actually not hidden, but showing to you, right? The, the, the way he draws, of course, you know this, is very interesting because it's like he starts drawing somewhere or painting somewhere, and he goes continuously throughout the painting. Like, he, I'm not, I'm not uh, taking away the, the brush or, or, or the pencil or the carbon. I'm like continuing. It's like a continuous. And, and this is so great because it's like a freehand style that goes and moves and, and, and is really fluid and it really dances on the canvas. And it shows you also very interesting the integration of things with people, with the characters. Here, for example, you take a look at the sheet, the white sheet, how the white sheet is completely integrated with the body of the woman. It's like really making, making one unity. 
Now, take a look at this one. Even, even stronger here because you have two figures, but the two figures are completely intertwined. The two figures are completely embedded into each other. Take a look at the hands and the fingers. The fingers in, in Chile are fascinating always. Take a look at how the hands of the woman carefully and with, with a lot of tenderness touch on the, on the man and the man uh, um, puts his arm around him with a lot of strength. You can see the muscles being tense. You can see the, uh, again, the, the sheet of the sheet, the white sheet below and the sheet integrated with the bodies and the sheet integrating with the green grass as well. So everything is in a unity and the color. Now, let me emphasize here the color because what is striking here, of course, is not only the beautiful green of the grass, which is going to be uh, very present in, uh, in other um, expressionists, especially in the German expressionism. But here I want to call your attention to, and we will talk more about this later, about the skin. Take a look at the fantastic colors of the skin. So this is there you start seeing the greens and the oranges and the yellows as opposed to the beige or the rosas or the pinks, right? Now, nudity paintings by Chile are also going to be grotesque, are also going to be sometimes very strong. Like, it, it, it bothers me to look at this. It really has too much strength. And it even looks like a little bit like an animal. Take a look at the hand. Take a look at how skinny he is. So really, like a, in anxiety, like in a drama, take a look at the face. So that is why I call the colors of existence, because through the colors, he shows you the drama of human existence. Now, the drawing, once again, is so beautiful and so perfect because he starts and with only one line I'm going to give you the full idea of this woman with only one line I go and I don't need shadows take a look he doesn't even need shadows he doesn't even need other colors just with the line and he shows us how this girl or this woman is lay, laying there on the bed or the floor and the body really really places itself with its weight and its volume um, now, take a look at this one. I think this one is fascinating as well. There is a woman um, here posing for him in an erotic uh, uh, position, but take a look that her eyes and her mind is completely somewhere else. Her mind is a thousand miles away, lost somewhere. So that's the drama of existence, once again. I am here physically, I might be in my world physically, but mentally and with my heart and with my brain, I'm so goddamn far away. That is the drama of existence in Chile and that is what I think is so beautiful to observe. No? Because she is there like cooperating, but in a, in a different way, she's still alive and she's somewhere else. No? Now. Again, on the drawing, take a look at this one. I, I think this one is, is, I don't know if call it beautiful. I don't think it's beautiful, but I think it's m a masterpiece because with, again, just a couple of lines, he shows you the weight of the body, the, the, the thickness and the, uh, 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 and the fat of the legs and the arms and the breast. And the, uh, uh, you can f sort of feel the back of the woman and, and her hair. He's like so human and at the same is like a little bit like uh, humiliating because put yourself into that position, you know, show me your, your backside and, and I'm going to throw you but because, but not in a negative way, but in the, in the sense that I want to show how hard human existence is. I, I think that's more the point. Now, 1911, Chile meets uh, Wally, uh, Valburga Neutzil. And that's going to be, of course, a super event, uh, is the woman, I, I, I think, uh, the woman of his life. And definitely he is the man of, his, of her life for her. Wally is going to be totally in love with him. He used to be a model uh, with Klimt, and then she moves and becomes uh, Egon Schiele's model and lover. Uh, and I think she is the most difficult character to reproduce. Uh, really, if you want to... A copy her as we have tried it is almost an impossible task because the beauty of this woman and the delicacy of her face uh, is such a complex combination of strength and softness at the same time but I think it's important to try so 
And somebody who, who was coming to the conference told me that uh, she had at some point drawn this uh, painting. I, I, and, she, and I asked her, what did you learn? And then she, she said, I learned actually a lot because when you try to do the paintings or the drawings, you really discover how difficult they are. Of this painting, which I love, I really like a lot. That is why we selected it for the invitation. Let me call your attention to the, um, to the tights, to the Strumpfen. So look how the, 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 the work here on the Strumpfen is so perfect because you see the black or the violet, violet dark of the Strumpfen, but you can see through, you can see through it and you can sense the volume of, of, the, of the leg. You can, you can actually sort of touch it. The same goes for the arm, the same goes for the blouse, for the green blouse, it's like so real. Now, this is a very famous painting and very dramatic. It's called uh, precisely Todd und Mädchen, uh, Death and the Maiden because this is when uh, Egon Schiele decides to break with Wally and um, it's like uh, Wally is there holding him but he is dead or the other way around he is dead and she is anyway uh, Todd and Mädchen so implies that he is dead but he is dead because he is leaving her so take a look at the paradox that's the, the, the tremendous paradox they were so together, they were so well together, but they, uh, they were not able to be happy. They first live in Krumau, uh, and then they moved to a town called uh, Neuenlegenbach. And there at Neuenlegenbach, it, it happened the so famous incident, the so famous incident. He was, well, I mean, he was all the time painting women and painting children and painting people. And he had already like received sort of warnings from friends and from other people. And, you know, you should be careful because you're painting two young people and below the age of consent. So be careful. And so anyway, at some point he gets accused of kidnapping and seducing a, a teenager girl um, from the town of Neulegenbach, who actually had sort of used some excuses to ask him and Wally to take her to Vienna to see her grandmother and it, then it turned out that it was not uh, real but but they stupidly or for some other reason mm, we don't know for certain they went to Vienna with her and of course the family missed her and the father presented the uh, the demand at the police so he was arrested and this is um, you can see how the, the, the nudity, of course, you know, his paintings would not help because, of course, the police would come to his place and analyze and, and take a look at all the paintings and all the drawings and they were scandalized by them. They were totally scandalized and they say, okay, you go to jail. So he spent 24 days in jail. The first one waiting for the trial, the first 21 waiting for the trial, and then after the trial, the judge said, okay, we're going to forgive you uh, we cannot prove you that you had done uh, kidnapping and so, but we're going to destroy one of your drawings symbolically in front of the crucifix, because this is immoral. And then, uh, and then one of his paintings was burned in front of the. So remember what happened with his train drawings when he was a boy and the father. Now this is happening again, but now he's an adult. He's a painter, recognized painter, he went to the academy and then there's this judge, provincial judge, burning his drawing um, on the, uh, in front of the crucifix. And he gets very angry and he says, he, but, but he gets very angry, but he does not contest the, the morality or not morality of the drawing. What he says is once again, ich bin ein Kunstmaler. That means art is above everything. I mean, art is above, wake up you stupid policeman. Uh, art is above everything. You cannot judge me for that. But anyway, he is judged and he goes three more days in jail, which he suffers a lot. And he paints uh, some very drastic drawings. You can see them here. You know, like things falling, like very great things. And look, take a look at this one without hair. I, I presume his hair was cut. Uh, uh, he always had this beautiful long hair uh, on, on the top of the head. And then he, I guess he was... Uh, shaved so he's like totally like um you know um like really outraged by by the by the authorities and just confined there for some days he feels so so bad but anyway 
he manages to go back uh, to get out and he goes to Vienna back with Wally and then after some uh, time uh, in 1914 he meets Edith Harms so Edith Harms and uh, her sister uh, Adele Harms they were two aristocratic women um, with a well positioned socially well positioned so they were the legend goes that they lived in the in the apartment uh, just in front of them and the legend goes that they start flirting through the window and then eventually he invites them to a show and then they come to the show and then love starts love or convenience uh, so that he eventually marries um um edit uh, harms um, basically dropping wally and um, he even tells wally that um, he has negotiated <laughs> that in his new marriage which is a marriage for convenient reasons for financial reasons that he has uh, negotiated and obtained that he will go on holidays alone for up to four weeks a year and he proposes wally that those four weeks they spend together maybe in dalmatia or somewhere else and, and that is of course super shocking to wally and wally says forget it i'm not <laughs> playing this game and he and she uh, drops him forever so uh, paintings of uh, edith harms are very traditional are not nudity are not sensual are not drastic uh, you just sort of like a boring let me call them uh, in the sense of uh, no erotism it's uh, always with these traditional dresses with this old style look uh, right uh, like this and uh, that was uh, Edith Harm so really he made her uh, his wife but just like very very cold now however he also met Adele Harms and then the story is a little bit different this is Adele a painting of Adele as you can immediately tell he feels differently for Adele and the story goes that maybe he had something there uh, um uh, you know, but you can tell immediately uh, that the the perception of this woman is absolutely different. Now, you can also tell that the lines uh, here, take a look at the lines, take a look at the color, fascinating, I think. And, and then what else? Well, in 1915, Chile is sent to, to World War I. He's sent to Prague. He's uh, made a charge of uh, some prisoners, uh, I think Russian prisoners. And he wanted to, he even painted some of them um, he was uh, allowed to be there like in a, in a comfortable position so he could paint and he painted uh, some of his uh, prisoners he they say that he even became friend of some of them now uh, on february 6 1918 klim dies this is a painting by chile of klim death and then after that of course uh, chile is going to become the most important figure probably in the painting landscape of Vienna of the beginning of the last century. Chile goes and exhibits at the secession, creating this very, very famous uh, poster, this very famous affiche uh, for the 49 Ausstellung at the succession. And um, you can probably imagine that this was very controversial as the table uh, here represents or reminds us of the Last Supper and um, Egon Schiele uh, probably takes the place of Jesus Christ there at the, at the head of the table. So, you know, very dramatic, very, always very symbolic. And then uh, what happens after a few months, um, his wife, uh, who is pregnant, so Edith is pregnant, uh, but they got the Spanish flu and then they die in October of 2018 and three days later on the 31st of October 1918 Schiele dies when Schiele dies he says the Krieg is aus und ich muss gehen meine Gemälde sollen in allen Museen der Welt gezeigt werden uh, the war is over and I must go my painting shall be shown in all the world's museums so he is I love this because he is conscious the war is over, so maybe my war as well. I'm, I'm gone. I'm, I'm leaving. I have to go. I must go. But my paintings are of such a talent that they will be shown in every museum. And of course, as you know, they are. So they are in many, many important museums around the world. The Leopold's Museum in, in Vienna holds the largest collection. Uh, he created a lot. 
uh, for somebody who died so young, he created something like 340 paintings, 2,800 drawings, and let's say we can frame that in the range of um, 12 years, maybe, give or take, between his age 16 and his, de his death in, in, uh, with 28 years. So he created an average of 28 paintings per year and 233 drawings per year. That's a lot. That's a really important uh, creation. Bear in mind that he needed models for that. <laughs> that is why he probably got into so much trouble. One thing is to paint um, 300 paintings or 2,800 drawings from a photograph like I did or like we did. Uh, a very different thing is to have models for that, right? Well, now let's talk a little bit about the art uh, to uh, squeeze this uh, presentation. And uh, let me just tell you a little bit about the couples. Sheila's couples are great, I think. They show you a lot of strength and how I, I like them because, um, well, let me ask you, why, why, what special do you see here? What is so special about the couples? Well, what I think is so special about the couples is the strength, how they, how they hold each other, how they embrace each other. And, and I think that is unique because there's anxiety. There's a lot of, I don't know if it's frustration, anxiety, fear. I hold you very, very tight. Pregnant women, also very interesting. They show you the existence. They show you with the color. Take a look at the belly. Take a look at the breast. Take a look at the mouth. No? The use of red. Now, Achtung. Human skin is like that. Uh, pregnant women are like that. No? Let me show you another one. See this one. See the drama of pregnancy, the beauty of pregnancy, which is beautiful in a way. So the woman is smiling, but the woman is also in this position, reminding us a little bit, maybe the crucifixion because of the, the huge effort that being a mother implies, the pain that it will imply and so forth. Now, he also creates a very famous painting about his theoretical family. Theoretical because the woman is not Edith. But um, the woman, we don't know who she is, but she has a boy who never actually was born. But uh, Sheila paints this and um, uh, I think it's very, very powerful. I don't like it personally. I don't like it because it feels to me like too strong for my taste. But I want you to see all the drama and, and once again, the characters that are not here present with us. They are posing there, but they are not here be it the baby, be it the mother, they are far, far away somewhere. Sheila's lines, I've been uh, telling you already a lot about this, but let me show you. Uh, they start, they go, they flow, they move. They start, they go, they flow, they move, and they, with very little um, strokes, give you the perfect essence of human existence. Now, let me tell to you very quickly about something that I call the Sheila's puppets. Uh, is in the couples, uh, couples that look like puppets, like dead people, or like uh, people who are again not present, or that they have like a like a mask. Uh, look at the power of this painting. So there's the couple holding each other in in an erotic position, but they are mentally miles away. Take a look at this one. Take a look at the woman below. Um, the woman below. Uh, sorry about that. the woman below uh, has eyes that are completely somewhere else. The couple here, once again, holding very strongly, the eyes of the man look like the eyes of a puppet. Uh, take, take a look at this one. The women, no, they're um, in a relationship and then the woman below with her eyes completely somewhere else or probably dead or probably it's like a puppet, probably it's like not a real woman. Anyway, uh, Sheila's faces, again, fascinating. We have created several reproductions trying to trying to just practice, trying to just get a, a sense of uh, what the, this is. And uh, there are uh, very powerful faces, a lot of faces he created, a lot of, this is like, uh, almost like uh, taking selfies of himself all the time, no? showing you the power of his face. This is my favorite one. That is why we also reproduced it. Uh, take a look at the strength of this one. It's so beautiful. Looks like a, a little bit like a deer. No? Looks like delicate, but at the same time with strength and arrogance. And I show you like this and I put up my, my eyebrow and my eyes are very big and I am staring at you. So I am penetrating you. You are watching me, but I am watching you also backwards. And then there's this orange of my cheek really putting a lot of force. 
and then there's this green and the red, the, the red of the ear shows you that I am maybe, you know, I have energy. You know, whenever we have uh, red ears, it's because we have energy inside of us. Now, take a look at this one. This is the one that uh, David Bowie liked so much. Uh, take a look at the blue. We have tried to reproduce this one, both the head and the hand separately. Uh, in case you could be interested, get closer to the reproductions. Uh, although they are miles away from the originals, but they give you a sense of how difficult it is. And they give you a sense of how the lines are, uh, are painted and how the colors are painted. And the, the, the idea is that, that they show you the sense. Now, let me show you one more. And let me ask you, what do you see here? What do you see here? What I see here is anger, is fear, is revenge, is the power of uh, somebody who is really very like uh, sour of something that happened and wants revenge. That's the energy of Egon Schiele. Now, uh, a quick comment about Chile and volumes. We have mentioned it already before, but let me use this photograph, which is beautiful, we have seen it before, to talk to you about the, the volumes. Uh, Chile is a master in the creation of volumes with very simple lines, with low shadows, and that is what is fantastic. Let me make you a close-up. Take a look at this. So only with one line here and only with one line here and a little bit of shadow, but very, very little shadow, I give you the sense of her tight. I give you, you can almost touch it. You can almost grab her. And the same goes with the legs, although they have the strumpfen. You can see the forms below the strumpfen. You can see how the strumpf puts pressure and puts pressure on the, on the, on the, uh, on the body and creates these formations. Same, this one we have commented already. Now, color is existence, as I've been telling you. Uh, the greens, the oranges, the blues, no? It's like, I want to show you that I am not black and white. I want to show you that I have fire inside of me. I want to show you that there's all this energy on all this life. Green is life. I want to show you all this life. Red is blood. I want to show you the red. I want to show you my, my, my red appearing all over the place. In my hands, in my ears, in my face in my nose, in my lips, everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. Take a look at this one, which we, I, I like a lot, and that's also why we try to reproduce it. Uh, this, this is with so much energy and so much style as well. Take a look, it's like a, like a Greco-Roman statue, like an Apollo statue in, a, in Athens or in Rome. Like a, I'm showing you my power, I'm showing you how I am here. My, my, look at the neck, how the neck turns and, and, and the maxillars, how, how they are there and the mouth opens with arrogance and the eyebrow and the eyes is like a lot of energy coming to you. And look at the brushes. We try to reproduce them. Of course, it's super, super difficult, but I think it's uh, very, very nice. Now, the eyes, of course, we have talked about it. The eye that looks at you with, mm, I don't know what you're thinking. Yeah, I don't know if I trust you. I don't know if I can believe you. But most likely, you're not understanding anything of what I'm saying. Uh, you're not understanding anything about my art. Uh, uh, and, you know, yeah, okay, talk to me, but I don't know if I'm going to talk to you back. Again, the face. So let me uh, show you also once again here, using this face, Achtung. So the body and the face are not perfect. And that is what uh, Schiele is painting over and over. The eyes are not perfect. We have things, we have defects, we have imperfections. Schiele's skin is, of course, the apotheosis of that. Uh, Schiele's skin is never uh, beige or, or delicate like a Murillo or like anything like that. Schiele's skin is, is like, like somebody who, who got scratches, who got... Uh, um, veins who got the problems, you know, um, the, the, the skin, this is the skin that is real. This is the skin of Chile that shows you the existence of the figures. Now, Achtung, this is a real, this is a real skin. This is the, the real skin of humans. Our skin is not beige or brown or black. Our skin has that green and that orange and that red and that yellow. Our skin has those pigments, right? And has those imperfections. Take a look at these legs, right? You know, this is what uh, Schiele is painting. Exactly this is what he's painting. He's interested about the volume, about the woman, about the nudity, but not a perfect person. 
So, and the most uh, striking, well, I think everything is striking, the hands, Sheila's hands. Sheila's hands, fantastic, with a lot of movement, with weight. They show you, they are like, like falling down. They have elements. They, you can tell he knows the anatomy. You can tell he knows his anatomy. Um, we have reproduced this one. Uh, let me show you any particular thing that you that you find in this painting. Let me ask you any, anything particular that strikes to you. Well, what I think is fantastic here are the movements of the black lines that show you that the hand is like shaking, that the hand is like, a, you know, like trembling and moving. And the, the, take a look at the nails. The nails are like, they are in a position, but the position is like moving. Why? It's like a video. You know, it's like those photographs on the iPhone, iPhone that when you pass them, they move a little bit before they stabilize, right? Now, uh, an another set of hands. This one in particular, I think, is very, very uh, characteristic. Take a look at the length. Take a look at the length of the fingers. Now, Achtung. Human hands are like that. Human hands are composed of phalange, phalangina, phalangeta. They are bony. They are skinny. They are imperfect. And they are even like, uh, like um, you know, like some animals, like a, like a chicken here. You can see that it's this, a little bit disgusting because he paints a hand. Let me show you once again. He uh, paints a hand that suddenly looks like a chicken hand. So really not very nice, but, you know, it's uh, making reference of reality. The hand again, once again, take a look at that. And then, you see, he masters, definitely masters the anatomy and that's what he shows us look at this one you see he knows very well and show you once again the hands and the hands in the uh, in the x-ray the hand and the hand in the x-ray so what looks like an improbable position it is a real position it is a real position uh, this one which we have also tried to replicate also very beautiful take a look at the skinny body and how the hands fall down like a waterfall like a dead part of the body just like a hand would fall if you were to make it fall and make an x-ray. Just like that. Just like that. And it also, you know, it looks like, like bones, but it also reminds me of primitive animals. These are the feet of an um, ostrich, of an ostrich that has two fingers you know, with very ugly nails. It's like long and uh, like that. Well, that is what is showing us. Well... Now, let me make a super quick comment on the reproductions that we brought to you. Uh, I invite you to take a look at them, uh, go through them and um, observe them. They are, of course, far, far away from perfection, but they can show you a little bit uh, the content uh, and the different elements that we have been discussing. Uh, feel free to hang around and, and just uh, take a look at them. So with that, uh, let me thank you very much. Let me also um, thank once again Melita and uh, Claudia and the staff. And um, we are planning some other conferences for this year. As soon as we have the dates, we will let you know. Make sure you leave us your data and we will be inviting you uh, to some of the conferences. One of them is on the Japanese philosophy, the School of Tokyo, Japanese nothingness it is called. And we're trying to organize that together with the Japanese embassy. Uh, their, their representatives are here with us tonight so hopefully we can do that uh, very soon on top of that we will be making other pre other presentations on René Magritte, Tamayo, Picasso and so forth and, and also if you want to propose something just, just write to me and maybe we can uh, consider it now with that let me take any questions or comments that you might have let me remind you that uh, the video is ready on YouTube as of now so if you want to share this presentation if you like it please uh, um, sh uh, take a look uh, uh, our to our youtube channel and do recommend us as well so once again thank you very very much uh, to melita schubert and to claudia uh, and to all the staff of the austrian embassy my name is rick serrano and i have had the privilege to be your host tonight here at the residence of the Austrian ambassador. Thank you very much, Rick Serrano from Luxembourg. Take care, goodbye.